Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And as uh, we already had from the keynote speaker, um, the questions whether social gaming and real money gambling is linked together or not is something that is attracting increasing attention, not only from the gambling industry, from general populations, but also predominantly from policymakers. And just about before I was coming here, I read that France is currently announcing that they are planning to regulate social gambling and social gaming, which if they do go ahead with their plan, they probably will be the first country in Europe that will do that. Just to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Margaret Caran, and I'm actually working as a law lecturer at City University London. I'm also doing my PhD at Queen Mary University, and this is all funded by the Responsible Gambling Trust, which is why all the thanks to everybody who helped me to do my research and to be here. But most predominantly, I would like to thank the schools and the participants who actually allowed me to talk to them about this topic and to find out the data that, uh, in my experience, is actually really difficult to obtain. So the questions, what the questions comes with regards to UK positions, um, we had in 2007, uh, we had the implementation of the Gambling Act 2005. It took two years for it to be implemented. And the Gambling Act generally has liberalized the gambling industry in Great Britain, more or less on the basis of free for anyone who wishes to offer gambling services, they can do so as long as they are able to obtain the license and satisfy the relevant condition. What is important is to recognize that one very important aspect legally has changed is that the demand test has been removed. What it means, it means that anybody who satisfies the condition for the license must be granted the license and the gambling commissions or the local authority cannot refuse a license to a person just because they think there are too many providers in the area already or just because they think that they really, we don't want a betting shop number seven on the same high street, which is why what you have seen on the pictures before from the keynote speaker on our typical high street, you will find about five to six different betting shops on the same alongside other shops and other areas. So the liberalization is one big factor that has kind of expanded it, but it's underlined by the requirements that gambling operators must prevent underage access. However, what they must prevent is only access to hardcore gambling. And hardcore gambling is permitted to over 18s only. Lottery and football pools are the typical types of gambling that are considered to be medium times and they are permitted for anybody over the age of 16 in UK. And we also have the soft types of gamblings which are not regulated, uh, they are permitted by all. So for example, category D gambling machines can be played by anyone. You may, you may go with your child who is a five year old and they can play um, like the, pe the toy grabbers, penny pushers or any other category D gambling machines. And also uh, some of the non-commercial activities which are not regulated, for example, lotteries in schools, raffles at schools, bingo games and any other games can actually be organized with teenagers in uh, schools or any other youth areas <coughs> as long as they are not following any commercial activities. So as terms of the background, this is why in terms of what we mean by gambling and the terminal, this area is very difficult with regards to the terminology because what social gambling in this context means for my presentation is simply a gambling where you cannot win a prize. Because what is gambling under the Gambling Act 2005 in UK, you have three categories, is gaming, betting and lotteries. And gaming will be if you play a game that is of chance for the opportunity to win a prize. Now, the element of chance is very expensive so effectively any element of randomness will suffice for this requirement as long as it's not de minimis. So for example, a game of chess and the fact that you may draw a straw as to who is going to start the game of chess, that would classify as de minimis. But any other element of randomness will satisfy the requirements. Is what is restricting significantly is the 
opportunity to win the prize because prize is defined as only money or money's worth. And come to it in a second. With regards to betting, betting is pretty standard to everything else, which you have a bet if you're accepting or making a bet on anything, uh, which is unknown to at least one party, and you have a need for financial risk implicit, although it is not expressly stated. And lotteries, you must pay in order to enter for a chance to win a prize, which is defined in a similar way to gaming, only money or money's worth. And at least the first process for location of the prize in a lottery relies on chance. Now, what I would like to highlight from this slide is that gaming does not require any payment of money. So, if you can win a prize, even if you don't have to enter, that is potentially gaming within the act. Now, in terms of the meaning, what is happening here? Sorry. Oh. I just want everything to come here. I'll leave it like that for a second because something happened with the... <laughs> in terms of the money's worth, this is what is uh, particularly interesting because in England so far, with the case law, the money's money's worth is being something essentially material, not emotional or spiritual reward. So monetary price, physical property will be classified as a price, but virtual points, currency, game credits are not. However, the question which is uncertain, because it has never been tested in court as yet, is what about the virtual property in social virtual worlds? Like, for example, Harbour Hotel or World of Warcraft. In Harbour Hotel, I don't know whether everyone knows, but you can buy furniture, and so you can trade the furniture, the virtual furniture. The virtual furniture can be lost or it can be stolen. There have been examples of situations where they have been stolen. And they also be win by gambling. There is, within a harbour hotel, there is a dice game where players can gamble between themselves for the virtual property that they have in the game itself. Again, the question is, what about game currency exchangeable for cash? Uh, if you look at the more recent game FIFA, um, for example, points can be purchased on uh, like an eBay, and a, like an online market where people can buy and sell goods. And uh, the last times I've been looking at it, the FIFA points, one million points was about 12 pounds. So they can be converted into real cash. And also what about the ability to send virtual flowers, birthday cakes, extra credits to fellow players? They don't have any monetary value as such, but they may have the substitution effect. So this area in the middle box is the uncertain area, which uh, we don't know quite yet as to whether they are treated as potential price or not. What the gambling industry and the gaming industry is doing it is treating as it is not. Because it's not a physical property and it's not money, then they're treating it as this doesn't constitute a price in law and therefore they are outside the gambling definition and nobody so far has challenged them on that. <coughs> yeah. Now, so in terms of the context, so, um, we have the three categories that I was looking at, is the gambling for fun. What I mean by gambling for fun is the typically traditional gambling games but played socially but without any prizes. So for example, a family sitting together at a table and playing poker. No monetary prize, no points necessarily, just a social game without any ability to win or lose anything in the process. The second one is gambling-like activities within video games. So, for example, like in FIFA, when you are betting on a particular envelope uh, in order to win a good player, but you may not win a good player, you may win a bad player, in which case this is a form of betting. Or, for example, in Mario game, you have slot machines, a typical slot machine. In Call of Duty, you have a casino. So, these are gambling-like activities within your video games where there is no monetary payout, and also, there is no requirements to pay for it other than risk the virtual currency or the in-game points. And other gambling like online activities, so for example, penny auctions, again, this is considered in UK not constitute gambling, but the gambling commissions which issued the statement that penny auctions are not gambling did not specify the reasons as to how they reached the conclusion itself. Is money even involved in the first category? No. 
No. The gambling for fun is no man. It's literally like, for example, a family playing together at home or friends playing together without any financial consideration. But according to your previous definition of gambling, when you make them, it's defined as gam gambling, then when you input some money, right? No, you don't need to put some money. The definition of gaming under the Gambling Act requires the possibility to win a prize, which is a money. But it does not require anything to enter. But then that's not how children understand it, which come to it in a second. So the question is, the questions I ask is, should social gambling be brought under the standard gambling regulations? And that stems because does participation in social gambling leads towards real money gambling? Does it lead into gambling-related problems? Because there may be a question, does it lead to any problems like we had with a candy crush? Candy crush may lead to lots of problems, but not necessarily to gambling problem. And the final question is, what do young people think about it themselves? So the reasons why is because there is a lot of literature which <coughs> questions that there are potential problems and potential challenges and potential risks. So for example, the correlations between gambling for fun and real money gambling in particular, King, Temchev, and Bednarz identified that those people who play for fun gambling games on gambling website, with the emphasis on gambling website, are the most likely to also play with real money. However, Floros et al. is actually contradicting it because he's today saying that Yes, this is true, but only for people who seek out gambling websites in order to play the free demo games. And if they seek out those gambling websites in order to play the free demo games, they may already have a latent predisposition to be interested in gambling. And he came to these conclusions because they, he, they were unable to find similar colorations between people who play for fun games on Facebook and conversions into a real money gambling, despite the fact that the industry is trying to do it as much as possible. The second problem is the potentially misleading payout rates, a risk of inappropriate transfer of perceived knowledge. Gambling is purely random, and at least the vast majority of the slot machines and all the gambling games are designed to be purely random. The similar types of games on Facebook, they use algorithms and logistics to make sure that the game is more fun, more prolonged, and actually they give the impressions that the participants are able to win much more often. So there is the risk that children may not understand the difference and they may simply transfer that, oh, I am keep winning on this slot machine on Facebook, so if I play with real money, I'm going to get rich very quickly. And in fact, Seveni et al. has identified that a large number of gambling websites inflate the odds in a free practice games that are not maintained in the real games. Again, money on money's worth is not the only reward important to minors and young people. As we know, children don't only play, uh, at least that's what the literature suggests, uh, because they want to win money, but also for fun entertainment to experience the forbidden fruit. Virtual property may attract similar attentions. In-game points may be converted into cash, which of course it becomes that the reward for a game itself may be monetized, may be materialized. And finally, structural similarities, repetitiveness, near misses, all the video games are very similar. In fact, it's the gambling games that became very much like video games. But that also means that they having the same stimulus, they having the same effect, they having the same graphics, lots of audiovisual, lots of borrowing from cartoons, TV characters, all those things may potentially appeal to children. And similarities in players' motivations, need satisfactions, in people who gamble and play video games, they get the same arousal, they get the same reward mechanism, which may lead to a crossover between the two. And finally, the subconscious excitement with gambling without understanding the risk was identified by Griffiths. My, Griffiths, my supervisor, he had highlighted, for example, a game, Fluff Friends, which was played by girls as, as young as five years old, which in the game they had to bet on rabbit racing in order to win in-game money, which then they can use the money to spay on the car, on the, on the art within the game. Now, it's very unlikely that a five-year-old would be able to understand that they're gambling <coughs> itself, but they could get excited by the whole process without understanding what they're doing, without understanding the risks. So, um, the overall philosophy of the UK Gambling Act is to commercialize, permit gambling, but 
not deal with the social gambling and video games gambling at all because they are extent they are not classified as gaming because they do not give the opportunity to pay out the price or cash out any winnings which has to be distinguished from the payment for the game because they may have to pay for the games itself but payment is not required for gambling itself now in terms of what the Gambling Act also deals with the adolescents is that um, do they really want to prevent minors from gambling? And no, not really, because we only have prohibited commercial gaming, commercial lottery in category A, B and C gaming machine. But what minors are permitted to enter into is non-commercial gaming and lotteries, school lotteries, raffles, bingos, private domestic and residential betting, <coughs> category D gaming machine, and within the online context, the gambling providers have 72 hours to verify a customer in between those three days. Effectively, not in law, but in practice, a gambling may be permitted to gamble until the three-day period expired. But in terms of risk barometer, as per Adams, if you want to change the social behavior, you have to remove something that would attract people to it, then generally yes, because the actual potential rewards that children may get from gambling in financial terms has been taken away because they are not allowed to get commercial price winnings to be paid to an underage customer and all <coughs> stakes must be returned. So if a minor does succeed in gambling at regulated activity and it does succeed in, for example, playing and winning, he will not be able to get the winning out anyway. And of course, if it comes to the attention to the gambling provider that a minor has played, then all returns of stakes must be completed and if not, there are criminal penalties attached to it. But again, no preventions of other non-commercial expenditure gambling or gaming. So uh, there may be some young people who spend lots of money on video games and there is absolutely no regulations in this respect for that. So what do a sample of young people think about the whole complex area of gambling and video gaming and the overlap itself? In terms of the methodology, I did semi-structured focus groups with 14 and 17 years old based in secondary schools in London and Kent area in UK. It all has been ethically approved from the Nottingham Trent University Ethical Committee and I carried out 24 focus groups uh, and in each focus groups there were between 3 and 30 uh, participants. A majority of them didn't have the teacher present, but only two groups in fact were carried out with the teacher being in the room and all the students were assured of confidentiality and anonymity. But the main limitation is that the schools were self-selected and students were also self-selected and so they definitely excluded uh, potentially the most vulnerable groups which are often the most difficult to reach as well. And uh, because they all voluntary participation after the introductions which took roughly five minutes as to what the focus group was about, they were able to withdraw from it and only four of them withdrew from the discussion. Now, the actual final sample size, we had 200 overall number of participants um, from year 10, um, which is 14, 15 years old, 71 male and 36 female pupils. From year 12, we had 34 male and 59 female pupils. And um, in total, it came to a round figure of uh, 200, which was um, 23 focus groups in 14 participating institutions, and it was one youth club in addition to it. Again, limitations, qualitative nature, findings cannot be generalized, peer pressure, the students may have said sometimes things that they thought others want to hear, although I don't think so, that it played such a significant part. Risk of socially desirable answers, some group did um, hesitate at the beginning of the focus groups, they are usually opened up later on only. And inherent risk of children emphasizing or downplaying what they in fact do or think or don't do or don't think in total. Now, in terms of the actual findings, that um, most of the participants had very good knowledge of gambling activities. So collectively, all participants were able to name all types of traditional UK gambling activities. The only thing they didn't know were football pools, and in fact, in majority of focus groups, I had to explain to them what football pools is, but all the other games, they named it without being prompted at all. 
but not so good un understanding as the key components of those gambling. <laughs> and most of them had a very heavy preoccupation with the risk to risk stake money or material possessions, which is quite opposite to what the law actually says about gambling itself. And very secondary awareness of the skills, chance distinctions, and the need for chance element within the gambling games. In fact, it took quite a lot of probing within the focus groups to get out of them that, oh yes, for something to be gambling, you have to have a chance element. They were significantly preoccupied with the need to risk something for something to become gambling, which is an important statement for any preventions and education strategies that trying to protect minors from any gambling-related harm. However, despite the preoccupations with the need for financial expenditure, when it came to listing the gambling-type activities within video games, they were surprisingly accurate. And in fact, they listed many more games that I was aware of before it came, and they were able to explain to me why they thought those particular activities were akin to gambling. And except one which mentioned monopoly and except the other ones which thought lotteries was not gambling, all the other types of activities were surprisingly accurate. And we only had uh, only two focus groups which claimed that they haven't come across gambling-like activities in video games. One of the focus groups, in fact, did not mention any games which did have gambling <coughs> activities that I knew of. So there is a possibility that they, in fact, didn't come across any. The other did mention, so there was an issue with recognitions on their part. So what do they think? In terms of engagement, as far as gambling, 30 out of 200 gambled for money illegally. So they gambled for something that were, they were not allowed on, but only two gambled alone. All of everyone else gambled with an older person, so with the assistance of the older person, so it was an adult, friend, relative. Uh, in fact, predominantly there were parents who were purchasing the, the um, Grand National tickets or the lottery tickets or any other football pool slips which they were gambling with. Seven gambled online. All of them gambled using an older person's account. We, I had one participant who tried to register with his own name only to be told that his bank account is underage and therefore he's not allowed. All the others, they have gambled with the assistance of another person. Many played poker or penny up at schools with pocket money and uh, the vast majority gambled on permitted slot machines that are freely available there. For fun video games, several pupils played card games with family and friends on Facebook. Some played on various gambling apps on mobiles, and all but nine played a variety of video games. With the motivations, as you can see, the motivations is pretty similar between video games and gambling, but the emphasis is very significant and different. For this group, desire to win money and influence of the family was the most important aspect as to why those people have gambled, whereas the video games was predominantly for reducing boredom and fun and entertainment. So the fun and entertainment in gambling was actually very low down on the list, with other indicators, the peer pressure being similar and at the same level, thrill-seeking and uh, some very small numbers uh, showed evidence of escapism where they had a bad day mm. and they bought a lottery ticket because they thought, oh, if I win money, everything will go away. And uh, with regards to the fun video games, the social interactions and the competitiveness and ability to engage in activities impossible or prohibited in real life were the most important factors. Now, risk of inappropriate transfer, in fact, have not been seen by the vast majority of the participants. They were very clearly aware that gambling cannot be improved unless it's a poker, which was a different thing, and they have the view that if you play a poker, yes, you can improve your skills, but they also understood that this is not 100% and it's not guaranteed that if you just get better and better, you will always win. Only a small minority had showed the evidence of inappropriate transfers, like for example, Carm, 14 years old male, he thought that you can improve reaction times on slot machines. <coughs> Eric was probably the most um, crucial and dangerous transfer was that he was using the practice site to uh, work out the odds and to warm out, which of course that wouldn't work because the odds are very different. And also he thought that playing only black or red on roulette and doubling the money each time will guarantee a win, which is only correct unless you have unlimited funds. And that of course is not possible for everybody. 
Now, does social gaming gambling like in video games constitute gambling? The majority vote no, and predominantly because there is no financial risk. And again, significantly lower level of stress, lower level of competitiveness, more focus on fun and entertainment, and no real rewards unless it was a virtual property or ability to exchange cash for cash in-game currency, which was significant because they thought if you can't change the money, then this would be gambling. And some pupils even said that they would be more upset if they lost the virtual property than the real property because they worked so hard for it, whereas the real property quite often has been purchased by parents or guardians. <laughs> Minority, <laughs> yes, because focus on structural similarities. And um, they also thought that if you pay for points with real cash and then you gamble, you are gambling with real money as well. And the risk of subconscious excitement with gambling before being able to understand the risk, it was expressly articulated by two pupils. Jaffa, 17, is an interesting case because when she was 13 years old, she was playing Habbo Hotel and she lost 50 pounds of real cash without realizing that on virtual currency in playing a dice game in a Habbo Hotel to win the furniture of the other player. Why she didn't realize that is because she was paying by text message on the mobile. And she thought, oh, I've got unlimited text messages, so I'm not paying for it. What she didn't realize is that this particular text message was a premium text message, which of course was being charged by each one and was not included in the price package that her parents had. Now, she had a very negative experience. The negative experience was not only that she lost the 50 pounds, but her parents have deactivated her Habbo account instantly after that. Understandably, but that hasn't actually stopped her from carrying on and gambling later on. She gambled on Grand National and she was engaged and she only realized that what she was doing in the Hubble Hotel was gambling. She only realized that when she grew older. On the other hand, Tweak, 17, a female, these are all nicknames anyway. Uh, she played card games with family for money. Again, she didn't realize that it was gambling. She had a very positive experience. She found it that it was a very nice social time, social time with family and together with her family in relative time, but she wasn't interested in any gambling later on as such. So in terms of the, whether does practice scheme leads to a real gambling, this is my final slide after, before conclusion, I know I'm being, <laughs> running out of time. Um, several participants, including those who viewed gambling in a neutral and negative way, suggested that practice play may ultimately lead players to real life gambling, but what I could highlight is that there was a significant third person's effect. So they always thought, yes, other people may get attracted to it, but it not, didn't happen to me. And I'm not attracted to it. And in fact, some of them who were gambling, in fact, those who were gambling, find that social gambling and the other types of gambling activities were lame, boring, not really for them. So in line with the more recent data, it seems that for this group of people, gamble, social gaming, gambling-like activities constitute a very different proposition to a gambling for real money as such. So they, um, I'm gonna skip that because I'm running, and I think that what would bringing it under gambling legislation do, probably not very much, because our UK gambling legislation is very relaxed, it's very liberal. If it was even brought under the Gambling Act, it is unlikely it would be considered as a hardcore gambling and prohibited for children and young people. If it was prohibited for children and young people, it would make it, it would run the risk of overcriminalizations, it would make it increasingly difficult to enforce, and also would not necessarily deal with the entry points or with the risk factors that probably are not necessarily overlapping so significantly between the social gaming and the gambling itself. But I think what the regulation should be introduced is with regards to making sure that the fun and practice games are giving true representations of odds and are the same between social gaming and real gaming. And also to insist on fairness and transparency to all players, which currently is the case within the gambling industry, but not necessarily with, within the social gaming and to perhaps regulate the monetizations of the video games where minors may spend a lot of money without realizing that they're spending a lot of money on video games themselves. Thank you very much. Yeah, 
Um, in England, one. we have four types. We have A, B, C, and D. And the c class D category gaming machines are considered to be soft type of gambling and are permitted without any age restriction. Um, D, for example, will be like penny pushers in a family arcades or the toy grabbers or where they can only pay a maximum of 10p as a stake and they can win a maximum of eight pounds. So the financial limitations on stakes and the prices. So Um, they, they, that if, if it is the maximum amount they can win at any one time, then it will be classified as a category D gaming machine. I think we are the only jurisdiction in the whole world which permits children to do that. <laughs> yeah. It is, um, it, this seems to always been the case. That's not after the 2005 Act. The category D gaming machines were always permitted. But the participation rates actually now seems to be decreasing. And it may be because there are so many video games available which give the same fun that they're not necessarily interested in that.